as I was preparing to give this lecture, I was talking a little bit with John, and he said, you know, you could probably do an entire semester's worth of material from just the analogy of religion, and how true that is. I feel that it's not possible to do justice to this book in a single lecture, but I'm going to do my best. So hang on quickly, and we'll roll along with it. Joseph Butler was a bishop in the Anglican Church. He was the son of a Presbyterian and was sent to a school for dissenting ministers, but reconciled himself to the established church. However, Butler was a very modest man. He never tried to climb the ladder of success in the way that some other Anglican bishops did. He took the rectory of Stanhope, which was quite out of the way, was not a particularly rich uh, living, and so he lived modestly and within his means, while many of his fellow bishops were becoming multi-millionaires by the standards of their own time. In fact, he was so obscure that in 1732, one of his friends mentioned him to the Queen Caroline, and Caroline said, Is he not dead? To which the Archbishop replied, No, Madame, but he is buried. At the insistence of his friends and with Queen Caroline's help, he was rescued from that obscurity. And in 1736, he wrote The Analogy of Religion, Natural and Revealed, to the Constitution and Course of Nature. This is a sustained defense of Christianity, not against atheism. He really doesn't engage with atheists, and if he had, he would have written a different book, but with deists who acknowledge the existence of a creator and his natural providence, but deny all natural religion, so, sorry, all revealed religion. I mentioned that many bishops made quite a nice living off of being bishops, and uh, I even had the occasion to read a book once that was just an attack, no holds barred, on the clergy. But in that book, this little story is told, and it's told in several of his biographies as well, that a gentleman came to him once and laid before him some plan for a charitable institution, some benevolent scheme, and sending for his steward, Butler asked how much money they then had. 500 pounds, my lord, the steward replied. 500 pounds, exclaimed Butler. What a shame for a bishop to have so much money. Give it away. Give it all to this gentleman for his charitable plan. Needless to say, that was a somewhat unusual attitude. And in fact, several biographical notices of Butler report that he had such a hard time bringing himself to turn away the requests of beggars that he actually had to ride swiftly wherever he was going so that they couldn't come up to him and ask him for money, otherwise his soft heart would induce him to give them money, which he then would wonder about, and should he have waited or found a, a more worthy use for it. So he was a soft-hearted fellow, and certainly was not trying to make any kind of living for himself. Uh, everything that we know about him says that he was never zealous of acquiring money. In fact, someone once gave him a large amount of money, and he immediately turned around and wrote out a subscription for that very amount to a project of building a chapel, I believe it was, so that he would not by any means even appear to profit from it. Uh, on another occasion, he entertained at his own house a, a nobleman who might have been expected to get a lavish meal, and all that he got was a very plain meal with Butler, and Butler half apologized and said, well, this is my ordinary habit, and uh, I'm, I'm not in favor of extravagant expense, and I determined long ago that I would not give any countenance to that kind of thing by participating in it, so he always ate very modestly. The occasion for the analogy of religion is something that we've had a chance now to be seeing. Uh, you may think of Shaftesbury as you see this quotation from the advertisement to the first edition. It has come, I know not how, to be taken for granted by many persons that Christianity is not so much as a subject of inquiry but that it is now at length discovered to be fictitious, and accordingly they treat it as if in the present age this were an agreed point among all people of discernment, and nothing remained but to set it up as a principal subject of mirth and ridicule, as it were by way of reprisals for its having so long interrupted the pleasures of the world. 
There is, I think, strong evidence of its truth, but it is certain no one can upon principles of reason be satisfied of the contrary. That was his purpose, that was what induced him to undertake writing this work, and you can find similar sentiments in uh, Berkeley, for example, in Berkeley's works, and uh, similar motivations as well. Although Butler lived modestly and was for much of his life all but forgotten and, as it were, buried, uh, his reputation and influence grew uh, through the ages to the point where many people, whether they were members of the Church of England or not, gave credit and paid homage to him. So James Mackintosh, the author of A General View of the Progress of Ethical Philosophy, said that the analogy is the most original and profound work extant in any language on the philosophy of religion. That's a pretty strong statement. Thomas Chalmers, in his Bridgewater Treatise, said, I have derived greater aid from the views and reasonings of Bishop Butler than I have been able to find besides in the whole range of our extant authorship. Saying, in effect, that if you were to put all of the rest of the writings that have been done on this subject on the one hand and Butler's analogy on the other, Butler would outweigh them all. And finally, from John Henry Newman, uh, later Cardinal Newman of the Catholic Church, he said, Butler is the greatest name in the Anglican Church. Not light praise, that. The analogy of religion was required reading at Oxford for over a century. Undergraduates didn't have to read the whole book. They could skip the first few chapters of part one and read most of the chapters of part two. But I want to give you a connected view of the whole book. And so for that purpose, one of the things I've done for today's lecture is to attempt to summarize the argument, obviously leaving out many illustrations and side paths and interesting other things, but to summarize the argument of the analogy from the beginning. So here we go, starting with the introduction. Probability, not demonstration, is the guide of life. Demonstrative reasoning is fine for a few things. We can do that occasionally in geometry, for example. But for everyday life, probability is our only guide. God would have no need of probability. God could see all things immediately. And so there is no such thing as probability to the divine mind. But for us, probability is the very guide of life. And our ability to use probability depends on the analogy of things with our experience. So we can expect that in a book called The Analogy of Religion, Butler will be spending a lot of time talking about things in our own experience that bear some relation to the things about which we are reasoning. Part 1, Chapter 1. Consideration of the natural world without reference either to revelation or to a priori argumentation suggests to us that there may be a life beyond our physical death. Suggests. Now, from Revelation, we could learn much more, but Butler's point is to pursue this argument without appeal to that. We might also try to prove certain things by complicated arguments that are largely a priori. Some versions say of the cosmological argument and other such things, but Butler sets all those things aside for the purpose of this book. It's not that he doesn't think there might be something to it. When he was a student, he corresponded with Samuel Clark about Clark's cosmological argument and actually raised some very shrewd questions about that argument. Clark was so impressed with their correspondence that he included it in a subsequent edition of his Boyle lectures on the being and attributes of God. So. He was certainly capable of doing that kind of complex metaphysics, but none of that is allowed to affect the argument of this book. This book proceeds much more simply, and the first part of it entirely, on reasoning by analogy from our daily experience. So all that he concludes is this very modest thing, that there may be a life beyond our physical death. That's all he claims for the argument from analogy. Suppose that there is, then a natural question arises, how should we live now so as to ensure as best we're able happiness in the life to come? 
in our daily lives, our happiness or misery largely depends on our own actions. and We can foresee the consequences of those actions uh, to some extent. So it's not unreasonable, notice again how modest the claim is, it's not unreasonable to suppose that our happiness or misery hereafter may also depend on our actions, since the order of nature and the life hereafter are appointed by the same divine government. Notice how here what he is doing is presuming that the people who are reading him are at least deists. As I said, he would start somewhere else and produce a different book if he were writing for atheists. Chapter 3. In this world, the government of God is moral as well as physical. So just as there are rewards for prudent action and punishments for imprudence, so there are rewards and punishments for virtuous and vicious actions, respectively. Sometimes those rewards and punishments are not worked out fully. They're hindered by accidental circumstances. But that's the essential tendency of those kinds of actions. From this fact, we are led to expect that in a future state those accidental hindrances may be removed and the distributive rule of moral justice may hold more completely. So if we think that there are inducements to moral action and temperance here in this life, so much the more should we think that they will have a greater impact on a future life. Well, what's implied by the moral government of God? It implies that our present life is some sort of trial, and that we have the moral possibility of acting wrongly or rightly. So just as prudence in the affairs of common life is necessary if we want to secure our interest here and now, our temporal interest, so virtue is necessary to secure our eternal interest. And in large measure, both are left in our own hands. We are treated, and this is a point that he goes on to elaborate on, as though we are free. And he sees no reason to doubt that we are free. Therefore, to some extent, this is up to us. And it's not just that our future state is left in some measure up to us. This present life is also a state of discipline and improvement. Again, consider the analogy. In our physical lives, we acquire bodily strength and maturity of understanding by degrees and through effort. These things happen gradually. We're not born understanding Principia Mathematica. Morally, Butler argues that there is a parallel case. We are naturally inclined by our passions to forbidden pleasures, and this tendency is rendered worse by external snares and temptations. But we may overcome these difficulties by training ourselves to restraint and by developing the habits of piety, habits we are capable of developing if we will devote ourselves to the task. So not only is this present life a state of probation where we're, as it were, on trial, it's also a state of development. You can see uh, parallels here with soul-making theodicies, but this isn't really an argument against the problem of evil. This is an attempt to set out our present state in its proper light. Where's Butler going with all this? He's building up to the introduction of the question of revelation, and that's where he will engage most directly with the arguments of Tyndall, who of course said, we don't need a revelation. The pure light of nature, the original revelation, is all that we need, and anything that is different from it cannot be truly from God. Well, what about determinism? Collins had argued that our actions are all necessitated, and of course today many people argue a form of determinism as well. Bowler replies that it doesn't really matter from a practical standpoint because we can't act as though we were necessitated. Uh, in regard to our present interest, we are all treated by one another and by God as if we were free, and there is therefore reason to believe we will be treated this way with regard to our future interest. Suppose, for example, that we take the position of Herbert and think there's a religion of nature. Well, he thinks that this teaches us 
that we have duty toward God. But it's not a matter of duty if we are determined, necessitated to act in the way that we do. So even Herbert's religion of nature presupposes that we have the kind of freedom that brings moral responsibility in its wake. Still, people have objected against the wisdom and goodness of the divine government. But that supposes, Butler argues, that we have a grasp of the entire scheme. Scheme. We don't have a grasp of the scheme of nature. Nature itself is vastly complex. Ends are accomplished by means in a manner that's so intricate and extends so far back and so far forward, we can't trace the full causes or consequences of any event or anything. I hold in my hand a cup of tea. I don't know all of the details about where the tea came from or the styrofoam of the cup, where it was made, how it was made, and I don't know all of the consequences that will come of my drinking it and my discarding it. That is blocked from my vision even in the most mundane, practical matters. If I cannot tell the causes and the consequence of those things, why should I suppose that I can stand in judgment over the wisdom of God's moral laws? The analogy suggests that they themselves also form a system with causes and consequences extending into the past and into the future indefinitely. If I can't see those kinds of things for the commonest of physical objects and physical events, why should I suppose that I'm such a great judge of it when it comes to moral matters? It's not that Butler thinks that we cannot use reason to judge moral matters at all. He is not a deep, skeptical theist. But he thinks that there are definite limits as to how far we can extend our reasoning. And so objections in particular to the wisdom and goodness of the divine government suppose that we have what we do not, that we have this vast grasp of the moral scheme. Moving on to section two, Butler moves now from what we can know by analogy of nature to specific things about Christianity and specific objections to it. What, after all, is the Christian re revelation supposed to be? Well, it reminds us of things that we once knew and have forgotten. It confirms things like the existence of a future state of rewards and punishments that were only probable before, or maybe even only possible. Those of you who have a background in the scriptures will recognize the fact that the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, give us very little information about a future life. They're quite dark on that. It's not that there's nothing, but the passages that we can find in the Old Testament do not give us a great deal of information and certainly don't render it more than probable that there will be a full-blown state of rewards and punishments. The Christian revelation confirms that, makes it plain and level to the capacities of any reader so that the common man can understand this without engaging in deep metaphysics and speculative reasoning. It also reveals a new dispensation of providence for the recovery and salvation of mankind. This revelation if properly accredited, and that becomes a key point through part two, it becomes our duty to acknowledge the Son as our mediator and the Holy Spirit as our sanctifier, just as we acknowledge God as our Father. Knowledge of this fact about the Son and the Holy Spirit can be learned only from revelation. Deists themselves would admit that our acknowledgement of God as our Father was something that we could acquire through reason alone. But the means by which we come to know these things is not the important thing. Our duty is placed upon us by the fact that we do in fact know them, however it happens that we come to know them. And so there is room for things to be known by a revelation and then for this to impose duties upon us that we could not have come to by reason alone. There are three objections against revelation in general. 
First, that it's not discoverable by reason alone. Second, that it's unlike what is so discoverable. And third, that it was introduced and supported by miracles, which are not credible. As to the first point, Butler says our knowledge of the universe is so limited that we must be ignorant of numberless things unless God reveals them. So, from the analogy of the physical scheme, the natural scheme, we ought to suppose that there are many other things in the moral scheme that we might also need to have revealed. So the fact that it's not discoverable by reason alone is no objection to it at all. Second, in the natural world we find many things unlike one another in some ways, and so this should not be a ground for doubting them if they are properly supported by evidence. Again, that point will come up again and again. Third, miracles are not more contrary to the course of nature than comets or electricity or magnetism, but for someone acquainted only with the usual phenomena of nature, all of these things must seem incredible. So we have, in nature itself, types of events, whole classes of events, that bear no resemblance to our previous experience, and yet, properly evidenced, they are credible and should be believed. Miracles ought to be thought of in that connection and not as things that are common uh, or to be compared with things that are common and that everyone experiences or are the kinds of things everyone experiences. They should be considered as these extraordinary phenomena are considered. Chapter 3 of Part 2. Suppose, then, that a revelation is given to us. Should we expect that we should find no objection with anything that it contains? Again, you can see very clearly here how Butler is responding to Tyndall. And the point is that this is something that in the natural world we should expect because in the natural world we know that there are lots of things that appear just crazy. People come up with uh, things that they say to us. They say, well, a starfish, if you cut one of its limbs off, can regrow the entire limb. There are worms that you can cut in half with a knife, and they'll grow back to be two complete worms. These are crazy sounding things, and yet there it is. Um, because of the scope of our ignorance, we're in no position to say by what means or in what degree God should instruct us. So take the fact that if Christianity is true, it was withheld for many ages. And when it was given, it was delivered only to a few people at first. Well, we could say the same for the cure to diseases. And yet the deists think that that's not an argument against the goodness or wisdom of God, that we should only lately have discovered some of these cures and that they should be known and even available at first only to a few. If that's not an objection to the wisdom and goodness of God, then these things are not objections to the wisdom and goodness of a revelation. Chapter 4. Um, again, pursuing this idea that the redemption of man ought to have been done all at once and not disclosed gradually over many ages through a long series of means and persons and dispensations. This is just a foolish objection, says Butler. The same might be raised as an objection against numberless things in the natural world. The ripening of fruits, for example, is something that takes time. The growth of animal bodies is something that takes time. Uh, the analogy of nature suggests that this same progressive method may be followed in the dispensation of Christianity as it is in the natural dispensation of providence. So, again, if you're a deist and you hold that a benevolent God, who is worthy of your worship, is responsible for the natural world, then you cannot use against Christianity objections that would tell equally well against your own view. That is a form of inconsistency. How about the more specific doctrine of Christianity that we have a mediator uh, for our sins? Why do we need such a mediator? Why isn't our own sorrow and our repentance and future good behavior enough to enable us to escape all punishment for our past acts. Well, says Butler, this is contrary to the course of nature. So again, that analogy is being brought in to undercut an objection. 
we all know that there are certain courses of action by which people can bring misery on themselves. Alcohol and drug abuse and sexually transmitted diseases are just common illustrations of this. Well, once you've made yourself ill and miserable, ruined in health, how in general are you able to obtain any measure of relief? Usually, it's only by the intervention of others voluntarily taking compassion on such people. And those others who do take compassion usually have to undergo lasting inconveniences to themselves as the means of rescuing others from the wretched effects of their former imprudence. So, by analogy, there's room to hope for mercy for those who are, in the language of Scripture, dead in trespasses and sins. Room to hope that someone might suffer the just for the unjust, and that we might have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So this moral parallel to the natural world suggests that we may need outside help, that our own repentance, our own sorrow, our own intention to behave well in the future is not enough in the natural world, and so there is reason to think that it might not be enough in the moral world as well. How about another objection? Two objections, really. First, that the Christian revelation ought to have been universal. We see this in Tyndall and others. And that it ought not be left upon doubtful evidence. Well, Butler argues by supposition. Uh, suppose, for the sake of argument, that it were rested on doubtful evidence. What of it? God gives different people different gifts. He gives some more intelligence than others. He gives some more education than others. He gives some more opportunities than others. The real question is whether all men will be dealt with equitably in the end. But the Gospels themselves, in the teaching of Christ, give us reason to believe that those to whom only a little is given will not be required to return much. It's those to whom much is given from them much is required. So in the conduct of daily life, we act upon great uncertainties, and yet prudent people are those who consider these things most carefully. Those who act with the most careful judgment upon small balances of probabilities are considered to be people who are wise. So even if the evidence were not clear, would it not befit us in matters that concern our eternal interest to be prudent in the same way that we would be prudent in ordinary life? You can see here the English school of thought, this reliance upon probabilities and the analogy to a prudent businessman who weighs up things carefully and makes a takes considered risks in some cases, makes a judgment upon incomplete evidence. But all of that was just arguing from supposition. In fact, Butler says the evidences of religion are amply sufficient, and dissatisfaction with such evidences may, in at least some cases, be men's own fault. So at the end of chapter 6 in part 2, he goes into that question in more detail. I'll be quoting some segments from some of these chapters as soon as I'm done summarizing, and we'll get into some of that in greater detail. In the final chapter, he argues the direct and fundamental proofs of Christianity are miracles and prophecy, the two things that had been assailed by Woolston and Collins, and then arguments against them having been raked together by Tyndall. There are besides these many collateral proofs that may be taken together in a cumulative case as constituting one argument. That phrase, one argument, is an interesting one, and it's worth remembering that when Darwin, who had, of course, a religious education, put together his theory of evolution, he said that it was really one long argument, a connected chain of reasoning, not simply a deduction from first principles. Darwin learned to argue that way from Paley. Paley learned it from Butler. So there's a chain of influence here regarding cumulative cases. And 
we owe that argument our most careful attention, weighing up carefully both the positive evidence and any objections we may encounter, remembering, and this is a very interesting point, that a mistake on one side may be, in its consequences, much more dangerous than a mistake on the other. That's a direct quotation, and it's fascinating to compare and contrast this with Pascal's wager. Pascal's wager says that even in a case where the evidence is balanced, it might be reasonable to cast your lot on the side that gives you the biggest return and gives you the fewest risks. That could be a prudent decision in business. Pascal does not think that the evidence is evenly balanced. He thinks that there's a good deal of evidence for Christianity, but as a sort of thought experiment, he does this bit of decision theory. Well, note what Butler is doing and how it's different from what Pascal does. Two things. First of all, Butler filled out more completely than Pascal was able to do before his death the nature of the arguments which, in his view, made Christianity likely probable, commended to a rational mind. But second, he says, suppose that you have only an imperfect understanding of it. Suppose that you see only enough of it to think to yourself, you know, that might be true. Then you have a duty, not of belief, but of inquiry. And the duty of inquiry runs like this. If knowing that there is something to this evidence, that it can't just be dismissed, you nevertheless refuse to look into it any further, then you are taking great risks that you don't need to take because you could inquire further. And nothing can excuse you if you fail to do that inquiry. So it's different from, and I think in some ways more defensible than, the version of Pascal's wager, at least, that is most commonly discussed in philosophy classes. So I would like to christen this Butler's wager. When I uh, was in Europe some years ago, I was speaking with Al Hayek, who's a very highly regarded, well-known philosopher from Australia, and Al has written quite a bit on Pascal's wager. He gave a paper on that subject at the conference that we were at, and at dinner afterwards I said to him, you know, there's a passage in Butler that looks a bit like Pascal's wager, but it's different. Here's how it goes. And as soon as I said it to him, he, he sat up straight and his eyes opened wide. He said, oh, oh, that's much better than Pascal's wager. He was really most taken with it. So if someone wants to write a paper on this, you have to give me a footnote and uh, attribute to me the phrase Butler's wager. I'm going to have to go through a couple of passages which I'm quoting extensively from various chapters and talk a little bit about what's going on in them. The first one I take from part two, uh, chapter three. Though objections against the evidence of Christianity are most seriously to be considered, yet objections against Christianity itself are in great measure frivolous. Almost all objections against it, excepting those which are alleged against the particular proofs of its coming from God. I express myself with caution, lest I should be mistaken to vilify reason, which is indeed the only faculty we have wherewith to judge concerning anything, even revelation itself, or be misunderstood to assert that a supposed revelation cannot be proved false from internal characters. Pause here. Think about Tyndall's argument that internal marks are both necessary and sufficient conditions of a revelation. Butler is not allowing that. For Butler, they are necessary. It's necessary, for example, that it not contain clear immoralities or contradictions, and either of these would prove it false. Nor will I take it upon me to affirm that nothing else can possibly render any supposed revelation incredible, yet still, the observation above is, I think, true beyond doubt that objections against Christianity, as distinguished from objections against its evidence, are frivolous. Why frivolous? Because, as he's been at some pains to point out, the scheme, both of nature and of the moral world, 
are very imperfectly and partially understood by us. If we don't have a full understanding of them, then we make fools of ourselves, objecting to different parts of them. Recall again the story of Laplace persuading the curators of museums to throw out meteorites because there was nothing in the analogy of his experience that should render credible the notion of rocks falling from the sky. There are many things like that, and as it turns out, Laplace was spectacularly wrong in this regard. So reason has scope, but the scope of reason is largely negative. It is to tell us certain things, if we read them, we could know by their contents could not be a revelation from God, but it does not follow that we are competent by reason alone and without accompanying credentials, like miracles or prophecy, to tell which things are from God. Notice what Butler says about the limits imposed by our ignorance. It is indeed a matter of great patience to reasonable men to find people arguing in this manner, objecting against the credibility of such particular things revealed in Scripture that they do not see the necessity or expediency of them. For though it is highly right and the most pious exercise of our understanding to inquire with due reverence into the ends and reasons of God's dispensation, yet when those reasons are concealed, to argue from our ignorance that such dispensations cannot be from God is infinitely absurd. The presumption of this kind of objections seems almost lost in the folly of them, and the folly of them is yet greater when they are urged, as usually they are, against things in Christianity analogous or like to those natural dispensations of providence, which are matter of experience. This quotation goes on, and the way that it goes on has struck some people as wonderful and other people as scandalous, but Butler doesn't mince words. Let reason be kept to, and if any part of the scripture account of the redemption of the world by Christ can be shown to be really contrary to it, let the scripture in the name of God be given up, but let not such poor creatures as we go on objecting against an infinite scheme that we do not see the necessity or usefulness of all its parts, and call this reasoning, and, which still further heightens the absurdity in the present case, parts which we are not actively concerned in. That is a strong statement on the scope of reason, as well as on the limits imposed by our ignorance. Truly, if any part of the scripture account can be shown really contrary to reason, and he's already told us what he means by that, manifest immoralities being passed off as though they were morally uh, acceptable, or manifest contradictions, then give that part up. But the kinds of objections that people are actually making don't rise to that level and have no ground to be called reasoning. A very famous passage. You can tell a lot about the philosophy of religion of a particular person by his reaction to this passage from Butler. Well, probability is the guide of life to us because we have only partial evidence. So, what kind of obligation should that impose upon us? There's a long quotation here that's actually quite interesting. It appears to be a thing as evident, though it is not much attended to, that if upon consideration of religion the evidence of it should seem to any persons doubtful in the highest supposable degree, <coughs> by which Butler means there is only perhaps some very small preponderance of evidence in its favor, or even only so much evidence as to make it barely worthy of consideration, but not by itself and yet worthy of belief. Even this doubtful evidence will, however, put them into a general state of probation in the moral and religious sense. For suppose, an analogy now, a man to be really in doubt whether such a person had done him the greatest favor, or whether his whole temporal interest did not depend upon that person 
no one who has any sense of gratitude and prudence could possibly consider himself in the same situation with regard to such person as if he had no such doubt. So suppose that you were to learn that your entire school debt was going to be paid or had been paid by someone, um, but you weren't quite sure if you had identified the right person. We think it's Mrs. Jones, but we're not absolutely certain. Wouldn't that put you under an obligation, even if you were uncertain, to behave especially respectfully and attentively toward Mrs. Jones? Nearly the same obligation as if you knew without any doubt that she was the one who had done it. In truth, it is as just to say, or as unjust to say, that certainty and doubt are the same as to say the situations now mentioned would leave a man as entirely at liberty in point of gratitude or prudence as he would be were he certain he had received no favor from such person, or that he no way depended upon him. If you even think it credible in some small degree, then that should change your behavior that will place an obligation upon you. And thus, though the evidence of religion which is afforded to some men should be little more than they are given to see, the system of Christianity or religion in general, to be supposable and credible, this ought in all reason to beget a serious practical apprehension that it may be true. Or if it's on the table for discussion, even if as yet you don't see that it is fully justified. Still, that should put you in mind of the fact that it might be true. Not just might in the sense of bare possibility, but might in the sense that it's a live option. And even this will afford matter of exercise for religious suspense and deliberation, for moral resolution and self-government, because the apprehension that religion may be true does as really layman under obligations as a full conviction that it's true. Not to the same degree, but it does lay obligations upon us. It gives occasion and motives to consider further the important subject. Here's Butler's wager again. To preserve, preserve attentively upon their minds a general implicit sense that they may be under divine moral government, an awful solicitude about religion, whether natural or revealed, such apprehension ought to turn men's eyes to every degree of new light which may be had, from whatever side it comes, and induce them to refrain in the meantime from all immoralities, and live in the conscientious practice of every common virtue. Partial evidence may force us to take a very serious view of what may be our obligations. Finally, on the nature of a cumulative case, the truth of our religion, this is from chapter 7, if you're wondering, of part 2. The truth of our religion, like the truth of common matters, is to be judged of by all the evidence taken together. And unless the whole series of things which may be alleged in this argument, and every particular thing in it, can reasonably be supposed to have been accident, for here the stress of the argument for Christianity lies, then is the truth of it proved, in like manner, as if, in any common case, numerous events acknowledged were to be alleged in proof of any other event disputed, the truth of the disputed event would be proved not only if any one of the acknowledged ones did of itself clearly imply it, but though none of them singly did so, if the whole of the acknowledged events taken together could not in reason be supposed to have happened unless the disputed one were true. Think of a cumulative case in forensic detection, or in natural science. In many cases, it's the accumulation of pieces of evidence all pointing in one direction that carries conviction, not the individual pieces taken one at a time. But this fact, Butler goes on to say, creates an asymmetry in our consideration of the evidence. It is obvious how much advantage the nature of this evidence gives to those persons who attack Christianity, especially in conversation, for it is easy to show in a short and lively manner that such and such things are liable to objection, that this and another thing is of little weight in itself, but impossible to show in like manner 
the united force of the argument in one view. You'll remember that last time I ended with a quotation from George Horne's letters on infidelity about pertness and ignorance. Butler, in his own way, is making the same point here. Long, complicated, cumulative arguments are not calculated to win debates where short, snappy objections are considered to be more fun to listen to, they're easy to get out, they're hard to respond to, and you cannot force someone to consider the weight of all the evidence taken together who is determined to fasten upon this or that little bit and show that there may be some objection to it. One can do the same thing with the existence of Abraham Lincoln. There is no empirical truth that is immune to this kind of caviling, and if once we allow that to take the place of considering all of the evidence taken together in a single view, then all of history and all of science would dissolve. So Butler's got a probabilistic insight about the nature of cumulative cases here that is, I think, very important, and you can find it, in fact, uh, in the work of Richard Swinburne as well. It is a happy accident that Butler, when he was at Oxford, was at Oriel College, which is the college that Richard Swinburne is at today. And when I visited Oxford a couple of years ago, I actually saw Butler's portrait in the rooms at Oriel College hanging on the wall. So there is a connection there with one of our contemporaries.